Um, well, thank you for the kind uh, introduction and uh, my thanks to the Institute for, uh, for inviting me to do a presentation. Um, as Warren said, for my sins, I, I, I trained uh, over a decade ago as an auditor, went through the, the pain uh, to get my CA qualification and spent a good 10 years with Ernest & Young. Uh, as part of uh, that process, we learned, uh, we saw the collapse of Anderson during my time, along with uh, WorldCom, Parmalat scandals and so on. And uh, it was interesting how the change within the audit fraternity occurred as well. Um, some of which I'm going to touch on today in, in, in my presentation. I'm speaking uh, on behalf of the Islamic Finance Council. I sit as a board member for the Islamic Finance Council. It's a not-for-profit body which was established to help promote the industry. Um, we specialize in four key areas, uh, one of which is government policy advisory. We've been formally appointed to advise various European and African governments. Uh, the second area is around the Sharia governance arena, in which we run the only global program where we train Sharia scholars on conventional finance using a CPD mechanism, which we do with the Chartered Institute of Security and Investments. Uh, we do that program along with the Central Bank of Bahrain, uh, Bank Nagar in Malaysia, and uh, DIC entity Halkama. As part of our work within this field of empowering Sharia scholars, we've spent uh, the last 11 months putting together uh, this report, which will be the basis of my, uh, of my presentation today. This report, again, we did together with ISRA, uh, the International Sharia Research uh, Academy, which is part of Bank Nagar and part of NCF uh, body there. The other areas of work that we are involved in is ethical finance promoting uh, similarities and shared values between the ethical finance providers and a whole host of community education uh, and awareness. Uh, we've also done work in select areas around Alcaf and uh, microfinance, areas which promote social returns, uh, and we've done a piece of uh, research around the concept of Tayyib, which was picked up <coughs> by the DIC uh, handbook, which we did together with CAS Business School, which is the next generation of Islamic finance products. ISRA, as I said, is the International Sh uh, Sharia Research Academy. Um, Dr. Akram Laldeen, Dr. Ashraf, who I believe were here with you, uh, I think last month at the, at the IIBI uh, thematic workshop, um, uh, they came and they presented on various topics. Uh, ISRA is based in Malaysia as part of NCF and, and works very much to be the global repository for information and fatwas on uh, relating to Sharia views or uh, relating to the contemporary Islamic finance industry. It was interesting through the, the collaboration of the IFC with myself, our executive board member, and uh, myself as an executive board member, our executive management, we had people collectively who we had spent over 45, nearly 50 years in audit, people from PwC, EY, KPMG, who were involved in putting this paper together and infusing that together with the Sharia perspectives from ISRA was quite, a, quite an interesting journey when we put this paper together. Uh, we learned a heck of a lot from, uh, from the ISRA team and we very much enjoyed the process. And it's a great example where we can work collaboratively in the industry for the benefit of the industry. Malaysia is a global, is one of the global uh, hubs for Islamic finance and their advancements uh, is, is something to be, uh, to be remarked on and, 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 uh, re and uh, applauded. Um, whereas in the UK we have a very strong tradition of education, research and thought leadership something which the IIBI has been pioneering in over the last two decades, for that matter, in terms of thought leadership emanating from the UK. So bringing together the two skills and complementary skills and mindsets, um, we've managed to put together this paper, which I will share with you the, the, the findings. Can I just ask before I continue, can I have a show of hands for those people who are involved with audit, assurance, or sharia audit? I know my mufti is sitting there, so I know you're allowing involvement. <laughs> Okay, so for the rest of you, this is uh, either interesting or you have no friends. What's, what's, what's going on? Uh, one or the other. Um, I will, in that case, uh, uh, try to explain to you, um, because you're not from the audit background, I'll explain to you in a particular manner, which will hopefully make it more um, useful and beneficial. So the, the, the approach to the paper, what did we do? We, we, took, the, we took our experience working in conventional audit, we, we analyzed uh, the world of Sharia audit and Sharia compliance, uh, and we did a comparative analysis with the practices of the big four firms and the top tier audit firms, and said, this is what's going on as market practice, or best 
best practice, I'm a bit weary of using that word, or market leading practice. And this is what's going on in the world of Sharia assurance and, and, and audit. Um, and we did this critique between the two to see, to see actually what are the gaps, what are the, what are the issues, where can the Islamic finance industry learn things and benefit from cross-fertilizing certain practices. As part of the process, we did a, a detailed literature review. Uh, more importantly, we looked at the Sharia standards of uh, select central banks, including Bank Nagara. Uh, we looked at IOFI standards, IFSB standards. And then we also took a sample, uh, a small sample of seven leading Islamic banks globally, and we analyzed their annual reports. And we looked back four or five years and said, actually, let's have a look at the level of disclosure that we are seeing within their reports. And uh, it's from, from that uh, analysis, obviously, along with our, our expertise in the audit field and ISRA's expertise, uh, we, we, we identified six recommendations, uh, six core areas, actually, uh, where we've highlighted a number of considerations within each one where we believe there is merit for further analysis and, and uh, examination of where practices in conventional audit can be used uh, to improve what's going on in the area of Sharia uh, assurance. So, from modest beginnings in the 19th centuries, the Islamic finance industry has grown to currently estimated around $1.3 trillion. Despite the global crisis, we've seen a continued expansion of the Islamic finance industry, and reports and commentators say this is going to double to three to five million trillion dollars in the next few years. As we all know, what makes Islamic finance Islamic? No surprise, the word Islamic. So what makes something Islamic? Do we understand what Sharia is? Do we understand the difference between Sharia and Fiqh? Do we understand what Maqasid Sharia is and all of these issues? The fundamental requirement for any Islamic financial product is simply for it to be in compliance with Sharia, Islamic law. And as I alluded to there, that's not as simple or as straightforward as people might think. Sharia compliance of financial products is assessed and certified by Sharia scholars. And though we have one of my scholars here, Mufti, is, is sitting there. He should probably be here doing this <laughs> presentation, so I'm, I'm embarrassed to speak in front of my Sheikh. He's got a few questions, don't worry. He's got questions, oh dear, now, now I'm in trouble. <laughs> and uh, these scholars uh, either certify, uh, certify the product in the individual capacity or they'll certify it as a collective uh, board. This is typically referred to as the Sharia Supervisory Board, the SSB. Uh, and most Islamic financial organizations will, will have such. Ongoing assurance of Sharia compliance is provided to the stakeholders through Sharia compliance certificates, which are typically issued within the annual reports of Islamic financial institutions. Now, before we go into that, it's in, in, intriguing to, to understand a couple of things I just want to throw out. Number one is Sharia and Fiqh. When you are ascertaining compliance against a standard, what happens when that standard moves? And when that barometer moves or is dynamic? It means your whole process needs to be dynamic. Sharia literally means, in Arabic, the watering hole and is the source uh, of, 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 uh, of Islamic law. Whereas fiqh uh, and the fatawa which come the solar fiqh, the process of deriving rulings from, from Sharia. The rulings that we have are dynamic. They can change from place to place. So a scholar may allow a certain product to be used in the in UK, but he will not allow the same product to be used in Saudi Arabia. And this dynamic, this, uh, this, this scenario is something which is so often missed in the industry. People miss this fundamental. Scholars may even allow a product to be used in the short run for the first few years to help enable the industry, but we'll say, okay, you have a shelf life of five years, after which, as an industry, as practitioners, you have to come out with an alternative product, and you must change that around. So this is very, very much a, a, a dynamic scenario that we are operating in, in the world of uh, Islamic finance. It's not necessarily a fixed barometer. Um, in addition to that, when we look at the law, as with, uh, as, as with any scenario, you have the letter of the law and you have the spirit of the law. 
spirit of the law, typically referred to as the Bokasid of the Sharia. And this is where there's been significant criticism of the Islamic finance industry, that the industry itself has failed to pay regard in a suitable manner to the spirit of the law. It's been overly, uh, overly engineered. Um, it has been, uh, it has been uh, imitating conventional products and has failed to innovate um, or, or to come out with alternative uh, products to create an alternative paradigm, which is particularly a shame in the current crisis where we see uh, the moral bankruptcy of the conventional financial system that we have and the fundamental systemic failure of the fractional reserve model that we have. So that's the one side on Sharia. A separate side I want to take back 1400 years um, to the beginning of Islam. Did we have banks which, after the Prophet Muhammad and all converted and opened up Islamic windows? No, we didn't. Um, there was a role of governance within markets. And uh, is anyone familiar with the institution, Institute of the, the Hizbah? Has anyone come across that? Yeah. This was something which was innovated at the time uh, of the Prophet of Salaam, um, and then thereafter institutionalized by Umar al-Khattab which was around having a market regulator. And one, one fact, I'm not sure if people know, who, who was the first governor of the, who was the first person uh, who was in charge of the, of the, of the Hizbah? It was a lady. It was a lady who was uh, the first person in charge. So the first central bank governor in Islam was a woman, for those who think uh, there is no role for women in Islamic finance. Um, this institute would go and govern and, and uh, regulate market activities from certain market traders, so if they were leaving mess on the road, or if there's certain business practices and so on. So there was a different architecture used for regulation there. Um, to what we have today. Uh, like we have shops today, a corner shop or a takeaway, they don't have their own Sharia supervisory board that certify what they do is halal or if they have an importer. But this is a specific, uh, it's a, it's a specific innovation within the financial services field. And one could argue by default, why actually is that there? Um, and does that need to be there for the next 50 to 100 years for that matter? As I said, the current assurance frameworks we have in Islamic finance are governed by IOFI, IFSB, uh, central bank bodies, and uh, the OIC Fiqh Academy. And the purpose of this report, I want to focus specifically around the external audit side, uh, the, the, the auditing and, and assurance particularly. Um, Islamic financial institutions employ Sharia scholars as consultants on their Sharia supervisory boards. The role of the scholar um, typically involves advising on the design of the product, uh, ex ante role, uh, as you'll see referred to in, in, the, in the IFSB guidance, um, and also attesting to the ongoing compliance. Now, with both the design and the compliance activity being performed by the same Sharia scholar, a dual role is formed. Each role has its own professional requirements. However, the compliance element in particular gives rise to a number of issues which the SSB members now must need to consider more seriously. A parallel can be drawn between this compliance activity and the requirement for assurance and compliance um, over the, the compliance for audit, the regulated compliance for audit that we see in the mainstream conventional audit, conventional audit uh, arena external audit arena. Auditors will come in, examine the financial statements and provide a report in the financial statements saying uh, whether they believe it gives a true and fair view or not. It's important for you not to get confused between internal audit and external audit. Over the years in the situation we are in right now, external audit and internal audit are two very separate procedures, follow similar methodologies but the reliance placed on internal audit staff, internal audit work, by external auditors is now next to nothing. External auditors um, report back to the audit committee but also give their statement in the, the independent statement 
in, 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 in the financial statements. And the internal audit team, typically uh, with internal Shure compliance unit, will be part of um, also provide their views as well. The breadth and depth of guidance on this continues to grow as regulators and practitioners enhance safeguards for improved independence and objectivity. Um, a continuous evolution um, of safeguards has become increasingly paramount since we've had the scandal of WorldCom, Parmalat and the collapse of Arthur Anderson. Most of, most of the Anderson world actually was subsumed by, by my firm, my old firm, Ernest & Young. The UK entity was taken on by Deloitte, US was ring-fenced, and the rest of the world came to, to, to join the EY practice. But these controversies are also there within the Islamic finance world, and recently we've witnessed uh, a number of increasing operational concerns. Um, these include the conflicting Sharia opinions by Sharia scholars, the multiple roles uh, one scholar has on multiple SSPs, um, and we've had issues of confidentiality concerns, we've had issue, issues <coughs> around sukuk defaults uh, and associated legal actions related to that, um, challenging, we've had cases in court where issues of sukuk bonds have gone to court saying, well actually it wasn't Sharia compliant in the first place really quite ludicrous, really, one would say. Um, and indeed, we've had the very public disagreements amongst the scholars on the issues such as the Goldman Sachs uh, Sukuk more recently. In light of these issues, um, uh, IFC and ISRA feel that the need to apply a professional approach to the Sharia assurance arena has become increasingly urgent. And the importance of these six areas cannot be uh, underestimated. So the first area, auditing your own work. And I'll run through this very quickly and then we'll leave more time for, for Q&A. Um, as I mentioned, members of the SSB are involved with the design and the, and the audit, the subsequent compliance and audit of the, the, the products. As you can see clearly, if you're auditing your own product that you've designed, straight away you're in an impaired situation. This gives risk to the issue of self-review, that you can be evaluating your own work. Um, so inherently, one becomes impaired uh, to participate in such an activity. And this impairment is not just in practice, but is also in perception, and both of these need to be managed. Now, when I worked at EY, uh, post uh, Sarbanes Oxley, um, and, and, and Anderson collapse. It became very clear, it filtered down to us, that there's certain activities, we used to refer to them as channel one and channel two, and there were certain activities which could be very lucrative for us, but if we did that, we could not thereafter do the subsequent audit work. So on many occasions, we would actually forego the audit. We would happily forego the audit, happily forego a few hundred thousand dollars of annual income for what could be a million dollars of consulting income from our consulting side. Typically, if you look at the revenues of the big four firms, most of their income, majority of the income is from non-audit services. So, um, this is a reality, and we've bought safeguards in to the mainstream conventional audit space to, 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 to stop us from auditing our own work and being in that situation. By foregoing the audit, um, we, th 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 there were a couple of advantages for us in, 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 at EY. Um, firstly, that it would, it would limit the restrictions that we had on, us, on the number of other services we could provide, like tax, transaction advisory, restructuring, operational improvements. Uh, and secondly, oh, as I said, the fees generated from this work would be significantly more than the audits. Now, scholars extensively involved in consultancy advice on the design and development of certain products. This issue can equally, as you can imagine, arise in that Sharia assurance arena. And one of the things which is important here is to ascertain now where is the fine line? When do we start stepping into this environment where you are auditing your own work, therefore you are impaired from doing such? Ascertaining the depth of advice uh, provided is important in determining that. There is, uh, for example, 
For example, if a bank has a Sharia supervisory board, comes to the scholar and says, Ya Sheikh, is this, is this compliant? Does this work? And if the scholar turns around and says, well, actually, no, go away, fix it. The bank then goes away, the product structuring team goes away, comes out with another structure, comes back to the scholar and says, is this compliant? And the scholar might say, no, it's not. They might then turn around and say, why not? He goes, because of A, B, and C. Now, if at this stage, the bank product development team goes away, restructures, it comes back, and the Sharia scholar says, yes, that's fine. But say they come back, and the Sharia scholar still says, no, it's not wrong. It's not, it's not compliant. At that point, if the bank was to turn around and say to the scholar, well, can you show us how to make the Sharia compliant? Can you now help us structure this to make it compliant? In that particular scenario, the scholar would then be moving from an area of compliance and ascertaining and verifying compliance to assisting in design activity. So this is where the fine line can be very easily uh, crossed. And this is something, naturally, you would not expect many Sharia scholars to be, to be, to be aware of this because they haven't spent two decades auditing. Right? So this is an example where, 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 where we feel Sharia scholars need to be a lot more careful in, in their activities. So what are, the, what are the ways we can try to uh, deal with this issue of, of, of auditing your own work. Um, we, we, we've, we've recommended that clarity and guidelines and guidance notices provided by IOFI and IFSB and central banks to the scholars. And the second thing we've suggested is, well, actually, what you can do, because you have to remember there's a limited number of scholars and the banks need their support in developing the products. What you can do is typically a Sharia supervisor board will have three scholars what you can do is, a, is appoint one of the three scholars as your lead audit member. And that scholar excludes himself from any discussions related to design. So when it gets to the point where the bank product development chap pull, pull their hair out and say, right, we don't know. Can you structure this for us? You know, we'll pay you some more. <laughs> right? um, at that point, the lead uh, appointed lead Sharia uh, board member, supervisory board member, can leave the room and, uh, and, and exclude himself from that part. Um, I will take questions at the end if that's, that's okay. As long as they're not challenging as well. Uh, yeah. That role itself can also rotate uh, as, as well between the different scholars. Moving on, issue number two, very quickly, is the use of Sharia audit opinions. Um, as I said, the annual report of an IFI will have the Sharia SSB report within that. Um, this report ultimately provides uh, stakeholders with assurance and the confidence that the IFI's activities and products sold during the period are actually in compliance with Sharia. The SSB provides this opinion based off the audit work done by the Internal Sharia Compliance Unit or one of its members uh, during the year. Now, this can be compared with the audit opinions provided in mainstream conventional audit. The output of conventional financial statements uh, includes the production of the auditor's report, which incorporates the auditor's opinion, and which in certain situations, this opinion can have a qualification on it. Uh, in certain situations, you even have a matters of emphasis paragraph included within the audit report. An example is uh, these qualified opinions can be unqualified, it can be qualified opinion, it can be an adverse opinion, so there's different levels there. There can be a disclaimer in there as well from the audit firm saying we weren't given the necessary evidence, so we can't, uh, we can't, uh, our scope was limited in our audit, um, and, and, and so on. Um, the emphasis of matter paragraph is for something which is even more, uh, even more adverse potentially to the extent that in the, in the, in the judgment of the auditors, uh, it's of such importance, issue importance that it's fundamental to the user's understanding of the financial statements. We have various guidance for this in the statement on auditing, uh, statement number 706. We have uh, guidance in the UK's Companies Act 2006 and so on. But if you look at the guidance that we have for Sharia audit opinions under IOFI and IFSB, it's very, very limited and states very little on the issues of qualified opinions. 
So our second point that we're saying here is actually Sharia scholars can use qualified Sharia opinions within the reports in a manner which can actually empower the Sharia scholars significantly and give the users of financial statements and the key stakeholders the necessary information that they require. An example of uh, some of the qualified opinions, um, this could range in opinions could be developed to reflect the different levels of qualified compliance. For example, qualified Sharia audit opinions might be issued when there are one or two instances of breach in Sharia compliance. Um, they could be issued where the Sharia scholars feel it's important for people to know that certain Sharia structures are being used, like Bayina, which is allowed in Malaysia but not allowed in other, in other countries, which is not encouraged in other countries. So it's, uh, it's, it's an opportunity to increase transparency around some of these issues. Um, in addition, the Sharia scholars, uh, if, they, if, they, uh, if they feel, uh, if, as I gave the example earlier, if they've given a, a particular bank a five-year window to, to screen out a certain product, like Doro, it can actually be said, you have five years, and this is in the point, now they have three years left, now we have two years left, and now they only have one year left. You can actually make this statement very clear as a qualified opinion. Um, so that particular inserting paragraphs uh, uh, within that report can be critical uh, of critical benefit to the key stakeholders and can also significantly empower Sharia scholars who are sometimes by the bankers told, yes, yes, we will do that, but actually in reality they never do and the Sharia scholars get marginalised and, 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 and left, uh, left to the side. And this is, you know, this is, this is very, very pertinent if we look at some of the issues we've had in, in the UK <coughs> with the Tuarok from I, I, IBB, Islamic Bank of Britain, and how scholars have effectively resigned from the board of IBB for such reasons. Um, but there's always something you have to be careful about when, when qualifying an audit opinion. Um, one of our clients, when I was at EY, uh, an Islamic bank, ended up uh, firing us as auditors because we told them we were going to impair one of the real estate acquisitions which they made just before the crash. They weren't very happy about that, but as auditors we had to stick by our principles, our code of conduct. And we duly qualified the report because um, they weren't happy to put the impairment through on the, on, on, on the balance sheet. And no surprise, a year later we were replaced <laughs> as, as auditors. So scholars might, uh, might, might lose your roles on the Sharia supervisory boards, but uh, you, at least you stand up for your principles, which is more important. Moving on to, to the third area, uh, external Sharia auditing. Um, what we're seeing here is that the process of auditing requires a certain skill set, uh, requires certain experience, and should be undertaken by suitably qualified and regulated individuals. So I'm a member of the Chartered Institute of Accountants, uh, ICAS, and there's a code of conduct which governs me and my behavior. Um, and, and for example, I have to sign off CPD requirements every year to the Institute. So the actual process of undertaking the audit not only requires a particular understanding of audit and a particular methodology on how you calculate sample size and how you go around doing controls-based testing versus substantive testing, but also the people involved in that process have to be uh, governed as well. Of course, you have to get a qualification to begin with as well um, to, to undertake such ACCA, ACA and so on. Um, and what we're seeing is actually you cannot expect Sharia scholars or those involved in internal Sharia compliance units to have all of this today, and the reality is many of them don't. So can we look at top tier firms or existing uh, audit firms to extend their audit that they're providing as external auditors to uh, create to include limited scope audits which cover some areas which then can be reported back directly to the SSB. The audit test plans involved can, 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 can be designed and tailored in a way that it picks up on particularly sensitive balances. Um, and, and, and so on. Moving on to, to, to transparency and disclosures. In professional services such as accountancy and law, um, service providers are required to be objective. Any perception, and I underline that word, perception of, the, of impairment of a professional's independence will lead to concern that adequate due diligence and professionalism has not been applied in 
the performance of their work. Now, applying the same professional attitude to Sharia scholars providing Sharia audit services is equally important, that they are objective and diligent in their roles. Alongside the challenges of independence from self-review that we talked about earlier, SSB members' impartiality can be impacted by the threats of self-interest and familiarity. So, for example, uh, I recall in my early days as an auditor, when we were involved in the audit team, we were asked, do we actually have a current account with this bank, with this client? Do we have any borrowings? Uh, do we have any facilities? And the more senior role you had in the audit, uh, the more you were required to be uh, to change your bank, literally. Uh, and, and not just you, it could be your spouse or it could be your close family member as well. The International Accounting Standards, uh, standard number 24, issued by the IFSB, uh, that's the International Financial Services Board, not IFSB and KL, um, sets out disclosures required in respect of an entity's transactions with related parties. Uh, and as I said, this definition of related parties included within that, and that extends on to include families as well. Uh, in addition, uh, legislation brought in in the US through the Securities Commission in 2000 requires now transparency on audit fees, and uh, the, the fees charged by the clients. So if you look at any annual report, you will see, say PwC are doing the audit of a firm, you will see fees charged by the auditor. Say fees for audit and fees for non-audit. Now, you can imagine, now I'm not saying anything specific to PwC here, but you can imagine if you earn $2 million non-audit fees and you earn $50,000 audit fees, in perception, someone could turn around and say, well, hold on a minute, are you incentivized to be doing the right thing? Of course, this process is in place to, to control such, but one of the things we've learned and we've had to do uh, in the audit fraternity is just disclosure, is we started with disclosure. At least we are clear and we are transparent on the fees that we earn. And this is something which, in the Sharia arena, we can look at as well. We can look at disclosure of fees paid to Sharia supervisory board members, splitting that between audit fees and non-audit fees. Uh, we can include and enhance things like annual declaration by Sharia supervisory board members to a suitable professional body or a regulator. Um, specific confirmations by SSB members before they take on their role on the board, um, that there's no conflict of interest, uh, there's no matters of even personal bankruptcy or any, any other such issues that the IFI should be aware of. Um, all of these such related uh, uh, disclosures uh, are, are all beneficial um, for the industry. Moving on to the final two points, um, and we'll conclude with that, competency and standards. Um, Again, I referred to this earlier. Uh, we have fit and proper criteria, which is, uh, which is required um, by, by the Chartered Institutes uh, for anyone involved in audit. Now, whilst we refer to, to, to this within some of the legislation governing Islamic finance, it's quite light. Um, you know, the B, the Bank Negara Malaysia and State Bank of Pakistan requirements, you know, they, they look, they have requirements for qualifications uh, and experience and they are similar to what we see within the FIT uh, category, um, but the gap appears to be within uh, the, the proper uh, area. Um, one of the key things here specifically is what I referred to earlier was continuous professional development. That's something that we've pioneered at, at the Islamic Finance Council along with uh, ISRA, Bank Negara, Body ISRA and, and, and the CBB in Bahrain. But the need for continuous professional development whether you are the most senior partner in a big four firm or you are a junior who's just started, every single person is required to sign off that they've done 25 hours, 30 hours of continuous professional development. I'm sure that's the same in the legal fraternity, in the medical fraternity, and also in, in the banking uh, industry as well. So let's apply the same professional regard that we do in the other professions to the scholars as well. And we believe this can help empower them um, to, to undertake their job and their responsibilities, discharge their responsibilities. Nobody knows everything. Um, things are constantly evolving. So if you want to talk about securitization and subprime mortgages 15 years ago, you know, I'd like to find, listen to people who knew a lot about that and credit default swaps. Probably very few. Uh, maybe, some the some, maybe some theoretical discussions. But uh, 
as we've seen in the last, you know, in the last seven, eight years, when they've come more to the fore in the last decade, actually, I would say, um, it's become something which is being contemporary, so therefore people need to have the knowledge updated on such issues. The final issue is on uh, income purification and charitable disbursements. Um, as you'll be aware, Islamic financial institutions are expected to conduct their businesses in activities which is, which is halal uh, within Sharia rulings. But you will find scenarios where unlawful income can be generated. Um, and this is allowed where it happens inadvertently. So there's two classic sources of impermissible income which requires to be purified in the Islamic financial arena. One is, can anyone name the two? Interest on bank accounts. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Interest income or non-permissible income. So if you have an equity fund and less than 5% of your income is from non-permissible means, that means say 4% is from non-permissible, 4% of your dividends need to be cleansed. Uh, another one, anyone else? Yeah. That would be perceived to be halal completely, so you wouldn't be involved in that. Another example is late payment fees. Um, as you know, banks are allowed to charge, Islamic banks are allowed to charge late payment fees. But the restriction is, so that this does not become riba, is that they're not allowed to benefit from such. So that has to be given away to charity. So late payment fees are used as very effective tools as deterrence for clients and customers who think they have a murabaha relationship and they're due to pay after uh, 20 months and they decide, actually, I'm not going to pay. You know, I'll pay after 21, 22 months. It doesn't matter. What are you going to do? Well, that's fixed, right? Um, you're Islamic, you know? What's the problem, right? Uh, any bank running on those principles would very soon be taken to the cleaners by its, by its customers. And this is actually what was happening in Bahrain by in, in the early days, in the 80s, in the late 80s, and in early 90s by certain clients. Um, so you, the banks are allowed to charge late payment, uh, late payment fees. The portion of that fee which relates to actually engaging with and getting back the letter that's sent out or the email that's sent or the telephone call is an allowable expense, but the rest has to be given away to, to charity. And that's an area that we found, again, from our analysis, there's very, very little transparency and disclosure on, uh, on, on that specific area. So that's an area that we, we, we've highlighted as well um, in conclusion. That's an area that we've highlighted as well as, as an area that we would recommend more disclosure uh, around that within the actual, within the Sharia Supervisory Board report, highlighting uh, and uh, within that disclosure the value of the impermissible income uh, during the year, the amount that's actually been dispersed. You'll find scenarios where banks have have been accumulating this late payment fees and these, uh, the, 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 these incomes of purification over a number of years. They've just been accumulated. They actually haven't dispersed it yet, four years down the line. Um, and sometimes that's for simple operational reasons, but that's an area where we can improve as an industry. It's an area where if we have enhanced disclosure around this, uh, it can be beneficial. So highlighting the amount, highlighting that it has actually been dispersed, reporting and confirming uh, that the charities it's gone to, um, and, and maybe even reporting back on the notes to the account on some of the social impact of that, positive social impact of such, and confirming that the IFI or related parties, so for example, you're not dispersing money to a charity run by your, your, your cousin or something like that, you know, uh, highlighting any related parties which are involved in that process. So that's, uh, that's, that's the six key areas that we, 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 we've highlighted within the, within, within the report. Um, it's just been launched. If you want a copy of this, uh, an electronic copy of this, you'll have to go onto our website, which is ukifc.com, and, and request one. And hopefully you'll get one in there <laughs> within a week or two, um, I say, no worryingly. Um, but uh, it's, 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 it's formally going to be issued uh, in the next week, 10 days. Um, and, uh, and we hope you find that as, as useful reading. So in, in, in conclusion, um, what, what is the, the, the you know, in, in summary, the, the key message is, as I said, the six particular areas, we've tried to put very specific uh, considerations in each one of those areas. We're not saying this is the only way to do it. We're not saying this is the best way to do it. 
but we're starting to highlight some of the best practices within conventional audit and saying we can cross-fertilise some of that to Sharia assurance. As I said, the comparative approach was adopted in compiling uh, the report. Um, I think a number of proposals has been presented, and some of these are targeted at Sharia scholars individually, uh, Sharia uh, consultancy firms, specific uh, reference to IOFI and IFSB and central banks as well is, is made there. One of the things we would strongly encourage um, is, is the process of self-regulation by scholars and advisory firms who look to voluntarily adopt some of these things. We know as Muslims we don't aim to be just in the realm of Islam, but rather to move to the realm of Ihsan, which is perfection. We should strive regularly for perfection. And where we see anything which, is, which will benefit our work and how we discharge our work, we should look to adopt that. So it's important that we have uh, a degree of voluntary adoption by uh, Sharia scholars. They shouldn't have to wait for Central Bank of Malaysia to revise their guidelines or IFSB to revise their guidelines or State Bank of Pakistan right now revising their guidelines. And they shouldn't have to wait for that, but rather they should be driving, driving that themselves. There's an evident gap in Islamic finance in the lack of presence of a professional services body uh, for Sharia scholars. In most professions, as I said before, we, you, you have such a body um, which accredits, regulates, and most importantly supports its individual members. That is clearly a gap, and I know there's discussions on this in Malaysia right now. We're looking at whether this can be done internationally, and I know Mufti Bakhtul has been looking at this locally in, in London as well. No doubt the, 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 the journey, uh, in conclusion, the journey the Islamic finance sector has undergone has, over the past decade, um, has been extremely exciting and uh, it's demonstrated significant positive growth and has attracted global interest. As the next phase of the journey begins, the need to maintain the Sharia integrity has increasingly become a central issue. Against the backdrop of the seismic collapse in the conventional banking system and then unveiling of the moral bankruptcy inherent within the prevailing unchecked capitalistic uh, model within which our economy operates, unfortunately. Uh, Islamic finance has a real genuine opportunity to present an alternative approach. I feel um, both the IFC and ISRA, we collectively uh, feel that the principles underlying Islamic finance, if properly applied, um, can lead to a more equitable disbursement of wealth, a high degree of systemic stability, and more regard to social impact in financing products. Uh, and these solutions are very much solutions which everybody in society is currently seeking. Ensuring that the highest principles of Sharia are embedded in the structures of Islamic finance industry is the responsibility which today's Sharia scholars are tasked with. We at the IFC and ISRA are committed to empowering and assisting the scholars, and by working together and providing positive mutual support, inshallah, we believe that the Islamic finance industry can continue its stellar growth. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much.